Thank you everyone for being here and giving us a time. A lot of pressure today because not only have all the speakers been amazing and they all got standing ovations, that's a lot of pressure as it is. <laughs> but we're going to talk about veteran issues. Today is Veterans Day. And yesterday was the 236th birthday of the United States Marine Corps. So all across the world, Marines are getting their dress blues ready to go out and have the biggest party on the planet. Karen and I, my wife, we started Archie's Acres about uh, six years ago when Karen's mother passed away and she got a spur to uh, buy a farm in uh, Italy, a Tuscan idea. Uh, Karen's Italian, her mother was 100% Italian, she did business out there. But I was in the military at the time doing back and forth deployments to the Middle East and I couldn't wait to come home to California. Uh, out of the four years I spent in the Marine Corps, uh, roughly two of them were spent in Iraq the other two, I was back home, training, ready to go back to Iraq. So we had a friend, a real estate agent, who found us a piece of property in North County, San Diego, and uh, it's very much like Santa Barbara and Ventura County, and that is very much a Tuscan feel. And so it was a good fit. We moved in there, and upon separating from the Marine Corps, uh, we started Archie's Acres. But before we talk more about Archie's Acres, we want to talk a little bit about uh, the veterans and what some of the challenges that they're facing. Um, again, I was in the Marine Corps for four years, and most of that good portion of that time was spent overseas. One thing that the Marines and, and all military members are, are carving the way for and setting the records for these days is the amount of time that we ask these people to spend in combat. Less than 1% of Americans have asked to volunteer since the attacks on September 11th. And that means a huge demand that the military has been put under for two wars and all the other uh, campaigns going on. We've asked those same people to deploy again and again and again to meet that need. Not only is it uh, a lot of time spent overseas, but the types of operations we do today, combat operations, counterinsurgency, counterterrorism, means that we push more responsibility on these very young people more than ever before. And we spend a million dollars on everybody who deploys overseas, roughly. And uh, when you have that amount of time spent overseas in that tight group, very cohesive, you begin to start a family. And you begin to come, the norm is combat and counterinsurgency operations. Um, and it creates a competition between that family in the military and your family here at home. Hi, I'm Karen Archipelay. And as a military wife, I can tell you that when, you're, when your husband comes home, it's so exciting because for this, he was seven months in theater, seven months home planning to go to war the next time, seven months. Colin was th three tours of the toughest times in Iraq, the taking of Baghdad, the taking of Fallujah in November of 2004. And then he went back, it was supposed to be the green zone, and it was Haditha right as that blew up. So when Colin came home, you can imagine, I couldn't wait for him to be home. I would know he was safe, he'd be with me. And what I realized as he came home is that his family was who he had fought with. <laughs> so although he was so excited to come home as well, as he got home, you realize that you're sharing that family bond because these guys have fought together. They've, you know, they've experienced so much life together that there is that separ separation anxiety. So coming home is a really big deal, but finding a way to blend those two worlds was equally a really big deal. So again, we spend a ton of time overseas and that lifestyle becomes the norm. And that transition back to the private sector and back home is very difficult. And when I came home, I was tired, you know, done all the deployments, done all the training, my time, my commitment was up started to separate. My idea at the time was going to real estate. Karen was already in the business. But I learned pretty quick that my personality has changed because of those experiences. And there was no way I was going to drive somebody around all day with a big smile on my face <laughs> and show them homes and be on the phone. <laughs> but we had this farm. Had about 200 avocado trees. I started working with them because I had a lot of time off before I actually my, ended my commitment. And I really enjoyed it. Uh, except my unit was getting ready to deploy again. And many of my friends were going back. And they said, you should be coming with us. We spent all that time, years together, in some of the worst environments possibly imaginable. And they said, you should be coming with us. And you have a feeling that you're right, I should be with you. I need to go back. And so I had an urge to re-enlist. 
But my boss, i.e. my wife, <laughs> wasn't having it. But going back to the transition, it's a very difficult transition for young military people to make. We have great skills, particularly leadership. We can go into third world countries, occupy, liberate, etc. Except the private sector doesn't really understand what we can contribute uh, when we get back home. And what this graph you're seeing here on uh, at least my left, on your right, is the unemployment rate amongst veterans compared to the general public. And what you see here in the veterans, particularly the younger veterans between 20 and 25, the unemployment rate is much higher than their counterparts in the civilian world. Um, and what does that mean? Those veterans, 24, 25 years old, they're the ones who spent four years in, two years of those deployed, came back, served their country, and now they can't find work because we can't understand how to properly reintegrate them. And it's becoming a huge issue. I mean, you would think that the, the, the ones who asked to serve during these times uh, would be we welcome home, and we definitely are, except we have a hard time uh, finding work. So we found a way to address the need, and that was that as my husband felt like he needed to re-enlist, and I felt like he didn't, <laughs> um, we created our farm as the place where we could create a business incubator. We actually have, we are a hydroponic farm, so also part of our, our growing methods um, is personal. We grow organically because organic food is very important to us. And it was also a very cool thing to be able to share that with veterans who had been exposed to so much, whether it was the MREs, whether it's the shots they were getting, and the stress of coming home, nutrition is ultimately important. So we had our farm, we created a hydroponic farm because of the high cost of water, and we started our Veteran Sustainable Agriculture Training Program. And so that's, that was what, how we chose to deal with it. So like Karen said, I was... <laughs> Thank you. So like Karen was saying, when, when I felt that need to re-enlist and redeploy with my guys, Karen was like, no, you're staying home. How do we stay connected so Colin could feel this need to be connected with, the, uh, with his Marines that he served with? And it was Karen's idea to start this program, but there are some contributing factors, reason why we think it's a good idea to integrate vets into agriculture. And we look here, we look at water, or the lack of, should I say. And you see the, the redder the area, the more scarce the water is. See, the United States has some serious issues facing the water. Growers probably here in Ventura, like in San Diego, are facing this every day. In San Diego, we have the most expensive water in the world. It's priced per acre foot. We pay about $1,300 per acre foot. That's compared to $5 to $20 in Northern California, etc. cetera. Um, but what does it mean when you have areas that lack water? If you have areas that lack water, you typically have areas that lack food. So you look at this region again, Northern, uh, Northern Afghanistan, Iraq, Afghan, uh, excuse me, Northern Africa, Iraq, Afghanistan, North Korea, and so forth, all lack the availability of water, all lack the availability of food, and all of which are in, not stable as far as violence, civil disturbance, and so forth. And that's what this map is showing us here, global instability. And it takes us back to the Arab Spring, which is occurring right now, but the start of that was in Tunisia when there was a 10% rise in global food prices due, due to a uh, continued glow, growing global population, continued scarcity of natural resources, i.e. water, which means continued scarcity of food. And it was a Tunisian farmer who went to the farmer's market and his cart was bare because of these costs increasing. A government official came to him looking for a bribe and he had nothing to offer. So they tossed his cart, spit on this gentleman. The next day, he went down to the government building set himself on fire, and Tunisia, Tunisia started a revolution, followed by Egypt, followed by Libya. So what we find is, globally, where we lack food, we lack the fundamental economies. Where we lack those economies, we lack stability. And this is going to cause greater turbulence as we go forward. And as we address the same issue at home, you'll see here on this map, the Inglewood, this is a map showing the availability of Whole Foods Market, Trader Joe's, and other access to good food. And if you look at the next slide, 
This is the availability of liquor and fast food. So is there any wonder that Inglewood has the highest crime rate? I mean, what we're addressing is an actual shortage of nutrition. And when you have a shortage of nutrition, you have angry people. And so we are looking to bring our type of agriculture into these areas. And to address the food deserts, we grow hydroponically, which can be set up on a parking lot, a rooftop. It can be in an abandoned building. You can actually make a very good living on a tenth of an acre. So this is not about having a, a mass amount of land. It's about using technology, which we call our technology the Xbox of ag. <laughs> now we talk about hydroponics, a lot of people think we start talking about hippie lettuce and whatnot, but <laughs> the reality is, <laughs> the reality is like Karen, it can help you really maximize your footprint. Per acre of hydroponics within a greenhouse, you can produce over a million dollars in gross revenue. Using 90% less water, by taking the crop out of soil, eliminates 70 to 80% of pests and diseases. You can contain any fertilizers so you don't have problems with nitrate leaching into groundwater sources and so forth. You don't need herbicides and so forth. And you can completely control any insects with other beneficial insects like lacewings, ladybugs, and so forth. Um, and so that's how our small three-acre farm came viable in an area like San Diego with high cost of living and so forth. And again, we bring it back to our VSAT. And VSAT stands for Veterans Sustainable Agriculture Training. So as Colin struggled with whether he should re-enlist or not, and I struggled with absolutely not, <laughs> we created our class. And we actually started it as a pilot program with the VA. And when we started that pilot program, we were working with a lot of veterans that struggled with homelessness. They struggled with alcohol, drug issues. And we found that growing food was such a rewarding occupation that it really helped them come back. And then we started looking at that same situation, and we thought, what if we were able to um, connect with people that were still active duty so that they didn't have to fall through the cracks, they didn't have to become homeless to get to our program. And we were able to connect through a community college, Miracosta Community College, and now Cal State, all 28 campuses. Right. And we were able to connect and create our veteran sustainable ag training, which teaches from seed to market. We actually go through all of the different phases of growing organic, sustainable food. At the same time, we create, they create agribusiness. They create a business plan during that six weeks, which is the pass-fail of our course. As you see on the screen now, these are some of our graduates over this last year. And as they present their business plans, we have a panel of experts, which are business leaders, HR departments, private investors, as well as bankers, and prior military. And they give them feedback on their presentation of their business plan so that it's the viable document when they leave our course. Now, not only is uh, you know, growing food, therapeutic, and all that other fun stuff, but <laughs> there's true market demand for this. The food and fiber industry, we call it in the United States, is a $1.3 trillion industry. And that $1.3 trillion starts with the farm. And what you're seeing here is the growth in certain markets. That orange line is the growth of the local demand, and the green line is the growth of the organic demand. You can see both are in positive numbers, above 10%, through some of our worst economic times in, in recent memory. So even though people have less money, we're willing to spend more on food, because we think it's more important to cut down our carbon footprint, quit shipping food from California to Maine, and so forth. Uh, we want to keep that money domestically. And more and more, we see eating well is a substitute for expensive health care, which is the number one, co or number one cause of bankruptcy in the United States. So. This is one of our students that actually graduated in February. His name is Mike Haynes. Mike Haynes was a nine-year recon marine, highly decorated. We actually met him at an Earth Day festival, which you can imagine I was there. <laughs> Colin was not, but, but that's OK. <laughs> we met Mike. <laughs> but Mike came, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mike came through our program, and actually, he he told us every day, no, I can't do this program. I can't make that commitment. He had a lot of the invisible wounds of war. 
that so many of our returning military deal with. And for him to make a commitment of six weeks was impossible. But we invited him to come anyway, and he took our course one day at a time. And Mike was able to, every day he would say to us, I'm not coming tomorrow, I don't think I can make it. We'd say, okay, but you're gonna miss this speaker. And he'd say, oh, well maybe one more day. So Mike came through and he created a business plan about hot sauce. Because he couldn't envision himself actually having land, he put together ingredients and he created Dang, with three exclamation points so you know he meant it. <laughs> so he's from Georgia. <laughs> but anyway, one of the in private investors said, I love it. He tasted it, he was sitting next to a Whole Foods buyer, and the Whole Foods buyer said, this is amazing. So the long and short of it is the investor came through, partnered with Mike, mentored Mike. Mike owns 90% of his company, the investor owns 10, and Mike is launching Dang Hot Sauce in Whole Foods Market on November 17th of this year. Thank you for <laughs> Thank you. We get to work with guys like Mike on a daily basis, and they create these great business plans, and the military is known for creating the best leaders. Half the time I spent in the Marine Corps, I spent becoming a greater grunt. The other time I spent being, learning how to be a better leader of Marines. Uh, but one of the things we always have a hard time with, particularly in this environment, is finding capital to launch these businesses, right? You need a capital to launch a business. So one of the things we're working on now with a group of investors is the Ag Vet Leasing. Now this group of investors is raising several million dollars and we plan to build over the next year three to five one acre greenhouse strategically placed in markets like LA, Washington DC, San Francisco and so on. Ag Vet Leasing will build these greenhouses. One of our trainees will occupy that greenhouse and create his own Archie's Acres that's his own without any, taking on any debt. And we'll be able to build more entrepreneurs and each acre will be able to gross over a million dollars per year. So we're very excited about that. In the next five to 10 years, we hope to have 50 to 100 of these things throughout the United States. And we're also, <laughs> thank you. We're almost out of time, but real quick, we're also working with the military because our hydroponic systems can be tainerized and can be rapidly deployed in, in support of uh, disaster relief, counterinsurgency, and counter counterinsurgency, and counterterrorism campaigns. Because in a matter of weeks with hydroponics, you can start growing food. With food, you can either feed people in case of uh, uh, disaster relief, or in case of counterinsurgency and counterterrorism campaigns, you can start building that local economies, and with built uh, uh, stronger economies, you can start bringing stability into those regions. And so we're looking very forward to that. And that comes back to the Buy Local program. Please look for the VSAT graduate logo. You can support our military, our transitioning military, not with a handout, but a hand up buy the products that you see with the VSAT graduate. If you see R2's Acres, you'll know it's us. Super Fidelis, have a great weekend. Thank you. Happy Veterans Day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.